Lots of social commentary going on in this chapter. Remember Shelley's clear criticism of the justice system earlier on in the novel? Justine becomes a victim of injustice and the judicial system and the church are presented as corrupt and unfit for purpose. Well, there's a similar focus at the beginning of chapter 14. On the one hand, you could look at the narrative which provides the backstory for the De Lacy's and Safi as a, a bit of a, an irrelevant sidetrack, but it actually reinforces what Shelley is saying in the novel about the justice system and about prejudice. Safi's father is described as a wealthy Turkish merchant who ends up being tried and condemned to death, apparently unjustly. The monster states, the injustice of his sentence was very flagrant. All Paris was indignant, and it was judged that his religion and wealth, rather than the crime alleged against him, had been the cause of his condemnation. The injustices prevalent in society are not just class-based then, but have their roots in racial and religious prejudice too. Perhaps the fear and rejection the monster experiences everywhere he goes because of his differences in manner and appearance are just tools in the hands of Shelley to highlight this wider social point. The representation of the De Lacy's is also key in this chapter. Look at how Felix responds when he happens to be present at Safi's father's trial. We're told that his horror and indignation were uncontrollable. He then makes a solemn vow to do whatever it takes to help the man escape. He finds a, a grated window through which he can communicate with the prisoner and promises to aid him in his time of need. Place this alongside the descriptions in other chapters of the De Lacy family as singing and reading and laughing and working together as the perfect little family unit. And you can see what Shelley is doing structurally here. The De Lacy's are perfect. They respond with outrage to injustice. They display unconditional love to each other and they sacrifice their own welfare for those that they've never met before. Sounds like the perfect adoptive family for the monster, doesn't it? Well, yes, except ultimately, of course, they'll reject him. By the end of chapter 15, the monster says, Felix darted forward and with supernatural force tore me from his father to whose knees I clung. In a transport of fury, he dashed me to the ground and struck me violently with a stick. If this is how the De Lacy's treat the monster, what hope does he have? The point you need to make if you're writing about chapter 14 is that Shelley is laying the groundwork for that later despair and disillusionment. The other fascinating section of this chapter is the account of Safi's mother. If you're looking at the representation of women in the novel, this paragraph is key, I think. So we're, we're going to read the whole of it. So just, just stick with me here and, and just focus on, on what we're being told. It says, if Safi related, sorry, it says Safi related that her mother was a Christian Arab, seized and made a slave by the Turks. Recommended by her beauty, she had won the heart of the father of Safi who married her. The young girl spoke in high and enthusiastic terms of her mother, who, born in freedom, spurned the bondage to which she was now reduced. She instructed her daughter in the tenets of her religion and taught her to aspire to higher powers of intellect and an independence of spirit forbidden to the female fo followers of Muhammad. This lady died, but her lessons were indelibly impressed on the mind of Safi, who sickened at the prospect of again returning to Asia and being immured within the walls of a harem, allowed only to occupy herself with infantile amusements, ill-suited to the temper of her soul, now accustomed to grand ideas and a noble emulation for virtue. The prospect of marrying a Christian and remaining in a country where women were allowed to take a rank in society was enchanting to her. Now the first point that you could make here relates to Mary Shelley's mother, sometimes described as Britain's first feminist. In 1792, Mary Wollstonecraft wrote a text entitled A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. 
claiming that women were in no way inferior to men, but were often denied the opportunity to prove their work worth through lack of education. In particular, she denounces Islam as a religion which at the time treated women as, what she says, a kind of subordinate beings and not as part of the human species. Some people see the representation of Safi here then as a kind of embodiment of Mary Wollstonecraft or at least of her philosophy. If you look at the choices that she's presented with, Christian Europe, where women are supposedly offered the opportunity of status and freedom and education. Note the references to aspiring to higher powers of intellect or an independence of spirit, for instance. Or the bondage and oppression of Muslim Arabia, represented by words from the semantic field of repression and constraint, such as seized, slave, reduced, forbidden and walls. Seems a fairly polarised choice for Safi, doesn't it? Well, on the one hand, yes. In fact, some would accuse Shelley of presenting a fairly uh, a misogynistic and, and, and unfairly misogynistic and Eurocentric view of Islam here. Maybe they're right, but let's look further at what she could be saying about Christian Europe. Is it possible that there's a hint of irony in Shelley's representation of Europe as so enlightened and liberated here? Let's look at all the women in the novel. All the women in the novel are either silent, passive, dead, raped, become victims of injustice, fulfil stereotypical domestic roles, are valued only for their nurturing or aesthetic qualities, or all of these. Not exactly the, the land of opportunity and liberty that Safi was hoping for, is it? Perhaps Shelley's juxtaposition of Christian Europe and Muslim Arabia here is more of a challenge to the reader, an attempt to get us to examine the plight of women in our own society rather than just condemning those further away.